Welcome to my new calculus channel. I am John Gabriel. In this YouTube video I'm going to be discussing a property called the Archimedean property which is probably one of the most least understood amongst mathematics professors and academics. And so I'd like to start with the <laughs> the information given on Wikipedia and uh, and begin by telling you that it's completely inaccurate and I'll explain why. Uh, the translation of Book 5 and Definition 4 by Sir Thomas Heath happens to be incorrect and I shall explain that to you in a moment but uh, even if interpreted in this particular way, let's say magnitudes are said to have a ratio to one another which can, when multiplied, exceed one another. That's just not saying anything. What's special about this ratio? <coughs> uh, if two magnitudes, when multiplied, can exceed one another. There's nothing special about it. Okay? So, <coughs> that's not what, in fact, that's not even what the original Greek said. So, let's go to the original Greek translation, which let me just show you in, in Heath's uh, uh, publication. It says here, this is the original Greek. Okay, So I'll read it out to you in a moment and I'll explain to you that this translation here in the English where it says these magnitudes are said to have a ratio with respect to one another which, which being multiplied or capable of exceeding one another is wrong. Okay, And so Let's go to this particular screen now and let me read the original Greek to you. I don't know ancient Greek that well, but I've put the Greek definition down here. So m my translation down here, which is in modern Greek. It says in the ancient Greek, Logon echin pros alila meyethi meyethi leyete a vina te poloplasia zomena alilon iperechin. Okay, so <laughs> if you try and do a Wikipedia translation, this is what you get in the red box, which is complete garbage. It's totally incomprehensible, okay? Uh, and that's understandable. I mean, you know, <laughs> even, even the modern Greeks today are not very smart, and most of them don't know ancient Greek, so. A lot of them are not even true Greeks. They're, they've been interbreeding with the Turks and who knows with how many other nations they were occupied over 400 years. Um, who knows who the ancient Greeks really were. Uh, I don't have that much respect for the modern Greeks. Um, they're not smart people in my opinion. Uh, at any rate, here's my translation. I taught myself modern Greek. I know that's a little bit of a tangent. Uh, to this YouTube, but in fact I haven't taught myself the Greek alphabet in two hours. Uh, same with the Hebrew alphabet. But at any rate, coming back to this, here is my translation of, of that ancient Greek. Ya afti meyethi ine adinato otan poloplasiazonde ya to ena meyethos na iperveni to alo. Okay, so what does that mean? In English, it says, for these magnitudes, it is impossible when multiplied for one ratio, or a magnitude, in fact, to exceed the other. That makes sense. So now notice, it is impossible. And that is left out completely from, for example, uh, somebody, somebody like Professor David Joyce, who has the site. Yeah, it's not a bad site, but look what he says here. It's, he's just taken the English translation. It says, magnitudes are said to have a ratio to one another, which can, when multiplied, exceed one another. So, in fact, it's actually the opposite. It's impossible for those <laughs> magnitudes to exceed one another. And David Joyce is just a very mediocre academic. He's not very smart. I've had some correspondence with him in the, par in the past, and I can tell you right now, he, he really doesn't know what he's talking about. But this is his site here, and so if you go to the site, that will be... Uh, his explanation here is, is complete junk. It doesn't mean any of what he's saying. has nothing to do with it. 
And similarly, for the Wikipedia entry, um, it's completely off track. The, the Archimedean property has nothing to do with Book 5 and Definition 4. In fact, you only can understand the definition property when you go to the works of Archimedes in the section called On Spirals. I'll explain these two propositions to you in a moment. In fact, let me do that now. Let's go to Proposition 3. Okay. So what is Proposition 3 saying? It says, given any number of circles, it is possible to find a straight line greater than the sum of their circumferences. Okay? So let's take this particular circle here. He says, it is possible to find a straight line greater than the sum. Well, the proof of that is very easy, isn't it? All we have to do is draw a polygon about each of the circles and then make the straight line equal to the sum of these straight lines. Yes, so it's, it's a pretty simple and elegant proof that that is true. Um, and you will see, I'll explain later on how that actually fits into the Archimedean property. It fits beautifully and you'll see in a moment how. But I just want to introduce this to you so that you can be thinking about it before I come back to it. And Proposition 4 says, given two unequal lines, that is a straight line and the circumference of a circle, it is possible to find a straight line less than the greater of the two lines and greater than the, less, greater than the lesser line. So what it's telling you is that it's possible to find this green line which lies between the length of this circle and the red circle as I've given uh, the, d the definition or the description here. If the line is the green polygon then the circumference of the blue circle is less than the line which is less than cir the circumference of the red circle. Okay? And so these two propositions are actually what define the Archimedean property. All right, and you'll see a little hint of it down here, where I have C is greater than L plus L over N is greater than L. But I'll come back to these in a moment. So now, um, coming back to this here, uh, I'm, go I'm going to dismiss this now because this here doesn't actually have anything to do with the Archimedean property. Okay, so let's get rid of that, make things simpler for me. <laughs> we don't need to save that. All right. And uh, let's get rid of that too because that's also wrong and we can dismiss David Joyce and now we can come back to the slide here. Um, I'm going to read this out. It is surprising how many real analysis professors are clueless as to what this means. <laughs> they actually teach it, would you believe, but they've never really understood it. It has nothing to do with those mythological objects you call real numbers, much less the concept of infinity or infinitely small. It is usually stated by idiot academics as an ordered field F has the Archimedean property if, given any positive x and y and f, there is an integer n greater than zero, so that nx is greater than y. Well, first of all, a field in modern mathematics doesn't even have to contain numbers. so. That's just garbage, and it has nothing to do with fields. Uh, a field is an abstract structure that came many hundreds of years later. Um, it has nothing to do with the Archimedean property whatsoever. So let me state it in a very simple but correct way, because it does not apply just to any field. It applies only to the rational numbers. Archimedes did not recognize any other numbers. Did you, did you get that? Archimedes only dealt with rational numbers. He, he, he knew nothing about those objects that you think about as real numbers. That's just absolute nonsense. Okay, so here is the statement in red, given correctly. Given any magnitude x, whether it's commensurable or incommensurable, given any magnitude x, there are commensurable magnitudes m and n, such that x lies between m and n. Okay, this is the correct definition. Everything else is nonsense. All right. So, let's, let's uh, look at the next statement. For any magnitude x greater than zero, 
there exists a commensurable magnitude n. In other words, a rational number, okay, a commensurable, commensurable magnitude n can be represented by, by a rational number such that the reciprocal of n is less than x. Both statements 1 and 2 are easily verified through geometry. Okay. And to verify statement 1, we have propositions 3 and 4. So what does statement 1 says? What does statement 1 say? It says that x lies between m and n, right? And I've just showed you coming back here uh, with proposition 3 and proposition 4 that this green line x lies between m and n, right? Very easily to, to verify that, isn't it? Okay? Because you can just draw a polygon around the bigger circle, which forms a line, and a polygon around the smaller circle, which forms another line, and you can verify that the Archimedean property is satisfied perfectly by that. Okay? So, that's to verify statement one. To verify statement two, you can construct... Uh, any parallelogram given any line and divide it into any number of equal segments. And that's very easy to do by geometry. Let me just show you. Oops. Get a pen here. I think I moved that. Okay, so generally what you do is you can construct it with a compass and a straight edge. I'm not drawing that very straight, but I think you'll get the idea. And if you want to say divide it into three parts, you'll just take your, your compass, position the point there and then just mark off three equal spots like that and then you'll draw a parallelogram okay so you'll do the same down here and you'll end up ha and then once you draw the parallelogram you'll join these equal parts and the line will this line here will have been divided into equal segments all right so that's what it means uh, this this last uh, statement here statement 2 and so this is, the, the, this is what is meant by this part here, that for any magnitude there exists a commensurable magnitude n such that 1 over n is less than x. Uh, it has nothing to do with infinitesimals because infinitesimals don't exist. And it has nothing to do with the infinity because the unbelievably smart Archimedes rejected infinity. Okay, so um, where are we now? I think I've rushed through that a little bit faster than I wanted to. But this is what the Archimedean property says. Given any magnitude, x, there are commensurable magnitudes, m and n, such that x lies between m, m and n. And in fact, when Archimedes approximated pi, he used exactly these methods here. All right, he used polygons to do that because all these straight lines here would in fact be either greater or lesser than some rational number right Archimedes knew nothing about uh, incommensurable magnitudes or those mythological objects you think of as irrational numbers irrational numbers don't exist and I have proved that uh, in this particular in this particular uh, YouTube video. Let me see if I can get there. Come on. Oops. All right, some kind of a problem there. I don't know why it's gone. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. Let's go back there again. Um, all right, so I have shown that in quite a few videos. I've shown it down here in how we got numbers and also in Academic Ignorance and Stupidity Part 2 and there are several articles that you can access there and see that there is really no valid construction of the real numbers. Um, in fact, Dedekind cuts and Cauchy sequences are not valid constructions of the real numbers, never were, even though they're accepted as valid in uh, mathematics. So you can look at these videos here and see why they are not valid constructions. And there is no such thing as an irrational number, therefore there can't be a real number because the set of real numbers purportedly includes the irrational numbers. Yes? Okay. So, this is the correct definition. Everything else is really nonsense. And I hope that you have 
uh, learn something from this presentation, you have to study it. You know, the, the Archimedean property is actually quite simple if you're taught correctly from the beginning. But given that most professors, in fact, given that no one after Euclid and before me actually understood what is a number, I was the first after Euclid to understand what is a number, it's not surprising, even though I said in my first statement here that it is surprising how many real analysis professors are clueless. It's actually not surprising. They don't know what is the difference between a magnitude and a number. Okay, and it's no coincidence that Euclid defined magnitude first in book five and then number in book seven. Because a magnitude is only an idea or a concept. It's not a number. A number is the measure of a magnitude. Okay, I am a real mathematician and probably smarter than anybody else I've ever met. Okay. That's a fact. I don't give a crap if you think I'm arrogant or not. I am smarter and my IQ is much higher than anyone else I know. Um, if you like it, fine. If you don't like it, <laughs> that's your problem. Well, I'm a little bit worked up right now, as you can hear. I'm a little angry because I, I've come across a lot of morons in modern academia who I can't stand. Um, so I think I need to cool down now. Anyway. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and uh, found it a little entertaining. I suppose it has been because I get a little worked up and emotional given that I know what I'm talking about and everybody else around me is a fucking idiot. Excuse my language. Um, and please do join me again in another uh, YouTube video where I'll be explaining more of these things. This is the new calculus channel and I am John Gabriel.